Hey everybody, you got Wayne here and you got Vale on there. On the, she's below me on my screen. You might, she might be next to me, however you've got your webcams going. <laughs> and we've got Mark that's behind the glass helping as he always does. We, I got to give Mark applause because <laughs> Mark has not missed one of these webinars in over a hundred, over two hundred that we've done, not once ever. And um, he's in Bangladesh, and it's actually about you know four thirty in the morning there. So it's uh, he's 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 working in a little different schedule than we do. They all say hi to everybody. <laughs> hey guys. So we are so privileged today, everybody. We've got Vale Dixon, and she's got Keith sitting over just to the left, I think, of her there. Um, and she's well, going to talk. Oh, well. <laughs> he took off. All right. Well, we got Vale alone now. Um, <laughs> we're going to we're going to talk about winter grazing here in just a little bit. But because Vale's new to us, and just so everybody knows, Vale is going to probably be doing a series with us. But it's not going to start right away. It's not like she's going to do this week and the next because we'll talk about this more a little later. But Vale has an amazing course that she's beginning to teach next week live. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. But we want to let her, she wants to get started with that for a while. And then we're going to have her come by, back on and, and do a series with us. So we'll let her kind of tell us when, when the, the, the busyness is, is wearing down a little bit. But it's also the start of her spring, really. She was telling us all before that they've got veggies that they're already harvesting outside. And some of you I know are in a pretty cold area. So are we normally, although it was 65 degrees here today. Um, and um, so anyway, what I'm going to do is start by just interviewing Vale a little bit. And then we're going to let her do a presentation. And then we'll have Q&A at the end, like we always do. So Vale, tell us a little bit about yourself sort of as both a business person and just about your life. You know, kind of where did you grow <laughs> up, where do you live now, just broadly, and just sort of how did you get into this very cool ag-related grazing, soil, all of that? Well, it certainly has been a journey. Um, I grew up in Buckingham County, Virginia, just one county over from where we are. And uh, just a country girl, grew up on a mountain actually, and climbing up in the mountains and the rocks, and really always loved nature, and was around farms when I was little, but more of horse farms, and not as much, my family lived on the mountain, so we really didn't have any, like my family didn't garden, my neighbors garden, and so I spent a lot of time with them, they turned butter, and they had potato fields and we, you know, canned and so when I was really little I was with them but those memories were so far back and I pretty much started growing up, was riding horses, internationally competing, going for the Olympics in college and um, it was through a wreck that I ended up getting uh, intrigued with the soil. In college I was studying international developmental politics, kind of the gap between the rich and the poor and what was going on with the poorest of the poor. I lived in a very poor county, one of the most poor counties in Virginia. A lot of obesity, a lot of, you know, just straight poverty. And um, I was just interested in, you know, how can we bring up our communities, the health of our communities. And so I went abroad, lived in South Africa for a little while, and started getting in, into, well, would I go into policy making in the UN or some NGO work? and the more I studied, the more I realized there are some NGOs doing some really good work, and those seem to be more of the small, medium scale organizations. But when any type of larger developmental policy or organization that had really gotten big, it just seemed like there were so many problems. And I realized that I'd rather be a doer than make policy. And I didn't quite see any policy that actually achieved the goal that it was intended to, even when it was well intended. So um, pretty much I got smashed by a horse. We were jumping, and it flipped over the jump. It caught a leg, and it somersaulted, and I had a 1,600-pound horse roll over my chest, land on me, and it crushed all my organs and ripped all my spinal ligaments, ripped my ribs off, ripped my shoulders off, broke my pelvis. And I was just trying to heal, and it was really through food and through yoga, meditation, breathing, everything I could think of, my water. I started looking at the water I was drinking and seeing all sorts of problems with that, and once I started learning about the soil, um, 
it connected everything I cared about, the nutrition, the healing, the communities, the animal health, the ecological health, water quality. I love to surf. I love the ocean. I live in the mountains, but I drive to the ocean to be with it because I really need those minerals in my body and that energy. So I, uh, the soil biology and the farming connected with everything. And I got involved with my family farms. Um, my great-grandfather was a farmer. My grandfather hated the farms because they always lost money. And he started planting pine trees on every field that our family had. And then he, he was a sawmiller. And uh, my, my dad didn't graduate from college and got pulled into the family business. The main business they had is actually a mining business, so a very extractive business. And when I was a little girl, I was very conflicted because I was like living on this mountain that my family was kind of tearing down the ridge. They weren't, it's not tunnel mining, but they were chopping up the rocks and chunking up the rocks. And I, I saw all this degradation of the mountain that I loved. And even though they were winning awards from the EPA and doing everything that they could environmentally, it's, it's a destructive business. And they're pulling up a lot of low pH material. And, and it was in the 80s that I read an article, an interview with my dad that he said, you know, we live on this mountain, we care about this community, and if we didn't mine this mineral, somebody would. And I did look at the hundreds of jobs that were created and the fact that Dad gave the schools their first computers and the 911 system in the county, and I could see this mixed bag, right, all these benefits of the extractive money, that, the wealth that came from this mine, and how my dad was trying to redistribute it in the community. And then I could see that, you know, we needed something regenerative. So when I found permaculture, soil biological farming, holistic management, those three things really was like, okay, I can take the wealth, you know, my family's land, and I got one of their farms. Um, they had accumulated a lot of farms when land was really cheap by investing their profits from the mine in land. And so I basically traded some stock that my grandfather gave me in our company for some land, got my own farm, and started doing regenerative farming and uh, permaculture and holistic management. So that's kind of how I got here. It's a bit of a long journey, but um, the one thing I can say from all of these cross experiences is when I experienced how doctors said my body would not heal, and I started doing the right things, and all of a sudden my ligaments were healing, injuries that I was told I would probably be a paraplegic, quadriplegic, you know, and old injuries even, that previous injuries that were healing. And, and the same thing happens with the soil. Like, if you remove anything that's holding it back, if you can figure out those things and find the weakest link, natural systems have an amazing regenerative ability. As well as communities, you know, I see even in our impoverished community, people have such a spirit and are so regenerative and the culture that still holds on from bluegrass music to different things in our community that, you know, even in South Africa, people that are very oppressed can still have an amazing spirit and I just am really intrigued by how can we in these natural biological systems, including in our economy and in our communities, um, how can we remove these barriers and stimulate regeneration because it, it happens so naturally, you know, when the conditions are right. So it's really more about getting out of the way of the natural system. Well, very cool. That was a great answer. I, I had a whole series of questions, but I'm going to shorten them and I'm going to go to one I wasn't going to ask. Um, so were you a, a jumper? Were you a three-dayer? What, what were you, what did you compete? I was a three-day eventer, so kind of the crazy people of the horse world, um, triathlete, you know, doing a lot of endurance work, and I really love pushing my body and training with the horses. We did the jumping in the arena, the dressage, which is very graceful and, and beautiful and more zen-like, and then we did the cross-country riding, which is galloping at speed across natural obstacles, and they don't fall down, so if the horse hits them, usually the horse and rider falls, so one mistake, one misstep. You know, you can't plan. You can make a plan, and we had a plan, but it's just like holistic management. Nothing ever goes to plan, so it really prepared me well for managing farms. <laughs> well, I, I know a little bit about three dang. Um, my where I where I grew my family up, which was southeast of Denver, and now we're northwest of Denver. We're only about an hour and a half from where we used to live. Our next door neighbors um, had a daughter. And if, if you ever knew this, and she's a, she was world class. She literally was also going for Olympics. And you'll know the name immediately if this is somebody you know, because it's a different <coughs> enough name. Um, but she, she 
is now a veterinarian, um, but she's done, she trains and teaches, so her name's Hurricane. Um, huh. And so that's a strange enough name. Hurricane, um, gosh, she's married now, but I can't think of what her maiden name was. Um, anyway, I just, it, it would have been a small world. If you yeah, this was in the mid-90s. Uh, well, she would have been in the mid '90s, also. I think you you guys would have been somewhat. That's why I thought you might have <laughs> might have overlapped a little bit. Um, we have a pretty big three-day um, performance area called. Um, it's just south of Denver, in the in. It's called um, Gosh Prairie Farms, High High Prairie Farms. Yeah. They do yeah. a lot of big. I don't know if you ever went out and competed at an event there, but that's where Hurricane trained out of and. Um, anyway, so I just I just had to ask whether it was three day, um, and so are you recovered physically now? I mean, you, you say you surf now, obviously, so you must you yeah. must be. <laughs> I uh, I would say I'm when I sleep and when I stay in balance, I feel like I'm 100% recovered almost, or better than I was when I was 18 because I had a lot of wrecks before that final wreck. You know, just learning to ride and doing it professionally, um, and so. When I stress my body is when things start, I stress my adrenals out, my ligaments kind of go lax and everything, all these old injuries start popping up. So I have to, you know, I try to take care of myself as well as I take care of my land, but I usually put myself last. So I'm learning, that's my lesson in this life, is taking care of myself the way I care for others. <laughs> well, um, you know what, I'm going to ask you two more questions in the light of what we were talking about. Um, and. And then I'm going to let you go to your presentation. So this one's a good segue. Um, I usually ask the front end of it, but I'm going to guess what the answer might have been. So I'm going to ask the second part. If it was a beautiful Saturday or Sunday afternoon, <laughs> you don't have things you have to be doing in the farm right now. You could literally just enjoy the afternoon to yourself. What do we find Vale doing today? What is that <laughs> absolute wonderful afternoon? That you would spend. What would you be doing? It would be a hard choice. Uh, I think my top three would be with my horses because I hardly get to. I, they're on the farm with me, but I don't get to spend as much time with them right now as I would like. Um, or if it, if I could get to the ocean and be on a surfboard with the sun rising or the sun setting, I would love that. I love the birds and the ocean. Um, it is a hard choice for me to leave the farm, so I, I looked for years for farm next to the ocean. I could just like ride down to the beach, but I really didn't like the rainy season and the tropics, and I don't. I haven't found that farm yet, but uh, I had to make do with what I what I have, which is amazing. So, or I love going out in the woods next to a stream or a river, or hiking, or just I really love lying down because in my job I'm always go go go. So I love stillness and quietness. So I love lying down in the grass or in the woods and just feeling the earth. I know that sounds kind of woo woo, but it really restores my body and listening to birds or just listening, just kind of opening my awareness and not having to think or plan. Like that's such a relaxation for me because most of my job and work is in my logical brain and then I'm, I'm a very, I have an extroverted side and an introverted side so when I get a chance to be by myself, which is very rare, I generally am just quiet and pretty still. Um, or I'm doing some type of gentle motion, like riding the horse or the waves. It kind of has a gentle, rhythmic motion. Well, again, you're, over time we're going to find out how similar we are. Everything you just said would be what my perfect time would be. And I, I grew up surfing. I grew up in Southern California, so surf oh, wow. everywhere you can imagine on the West Coast and, and then, you know, Hawaii and other places. But haven't, you know, I moved away. So I moved totally away from the coast when I was 25 and have never lived back near it again. I still have a board in SoCal and, and I'll use it and I can't paddle worth a darn anymore. I can still get, well, get enough, you know. Right. Back, right? So, um, anyway, um, one, two more questions. One of them I think I know. So you've already, I think you've already said this one, but everybody that's heard me do interviews knows that I asked this one. And I think you've already said it, so just if this is what it is, tell me about a negative experience in your life that when it happened, it just seemed like your world was ending. And then now when you look back on it, it might have been one of the better things that happened to you. And I, I was thinking of the horse accident, but it could be something else. If it's a horse accident, you've already told us. But if it's something else, go ahead and tell us and tell us why and what it was. I mean, I can think of a couple others. 
uh, more personal things with my family, but I think the horse accident for me is most pivotal because it involved the one thing that to that point had been my identity, a big portion of my identity, you know, this every minute since I was five, pretty much, spare minute that I wasn't in school, I was with the horses, and it was like, wow, it really, all the other accidents, I really thought, I'm just going to bounce back, you know, I broke this thing or broke that thing, but at this point, it was like, wow, I can't get out of bed, I can't see, I can't hear, I can't speak, you know, the, my spinal discs were pressing all my vocal cords, and, and it was like, whoa, and so it really, I remember the first, I just, it broke me into tears when I realized, like, you should be dead, and there's a reason why you're alive. And that was before I knew about the soil. That was in 2004. So, I mean, I knew I loved ecology. I loved the woods, you know, but I had no idea about what magic lied in the soil. So now I see that if I had just continued riding, I never would have. I always wondered how I could go to the Olympics. I felt selfish. Like, if I were going to the Olympics and spending all this money and time training, what, how would that be helping the world? And some people had always said, well, when you go to the Olympics, you'll be famous and you can you know, have some kind of cause that you support, but it didn't really feel right, and I didn't, I wanted to be doing more, and so that wish got granted, you know, and, and, and I still want to possibly train for the Olympics, maybe in dressage or something, but more for the, just the artistry, the mastery of, you know, I pretty much resonate with the energy of mastery, whatever dedication it takes to really immerse yourself in something, whether it's cleaning the floor or you know, doing the bills or whatever it is. It's, uh, I think it's just about being present in the moment and it's given me a gratitude for being able to breathe and being able to use my arms and walk around. But some of my friends, you know, they, they you haven't had that level of things being taken away. You, you don't always, you forget more often about just things we take for granted. So it's always a grounding place for me to remember, like, hey, you may be having a bad day, but you're walking around, you can smell, you can see, you can taste, you know, it's amazing, so. Yeah, by the way, did, did what she just said about doing the best at every moment you do, and she didn't say it quite that way, that resonated, I think I might have said that in an earlier webinar today. I was actually a guest on another group's webinar, and I, and some, I know some of these people were there, so I, I said, be the best you every moment of your day, and, um, I don't do that all the time, but I, I, I try to. And anyway, one last question. Tell us a book that you're either reading right now or that you've read over the last period of time that you just love and that you'd recommend to people, either title or the author or both. Um, I want to say something about doing your best first, and then I'll answer that question. Oh, um, go ahead. The more I, when I am not being my best and I know it, you know, um, I think that's what, we as humans are here for with each other and it, I think about the soil fungi and the synergy that exists in the soil it's like we can support each other when we're not being our best in a nonviolent way you know we can be clear mirrors for each other and support and I think that's what we're here for in our relationships to show each other when we're not being our best and reground us into that place where we're surrendering and asking to open our channels up again and receive what's positive in the moment um, and, you know, the, there's two books that came to mind, uh, none of which I'm actively reading right now, but um, actually three. One is, I actually have two of them right beside me. I'll grab them. Um, I with me at all times. But this one is Khalil Gibran, The Prophet. And um, I just love that book. It's so quick and easy to pick something up. Uh, the other one is written by someone... His name is Krishnamurti, but he didn't write it under his his name. He wrote it under an alias. You can hardly read the cover because it's so old, but it says, At the Feet of the Master. And it's, it's really big print, and it's really easy to read. And it's really simple, like, breaks things down really simply. It's like, you know, three things that are wrong about gossip. You know, or like, the things that, like, are the things that we all do that we probably decrease our energy. And then the other one is a book that was written by a friend of mine. Again, you can't see the title, but it's called Spirit of Fire. And um, it's, a, it's a poem that this guy, a friend of mine, took about 14 years to write. And then he actually turned his whole house into a recording studio and recorded music for six days in the Holy Spirit and edited that down to go behind the poem. And 
if you can find it, his name is Bill Everly, or he goes by a spiritual name, Bakhtan, B-H-A-K-T-A-N. He used to have spiritoffire.com. I don't know if that's still up, but those are three amazing books. And um, there's another one called Entering the Castle by uh, Carolyn Miss, M-Y-S-S, and it's a little bit of a text in the beginning, but then it goes into daily meditation. It, it treats your soul as a castle, and you basically have different rooms and levels, and you go into each room, and you ask your soul a question, and then you just sit with that question, and you see what comes up, and it really shows you what you're attached to, and what could be driving you subconsciously to do things that maybe aren't healthy for you, and it's just... It's more of a guided exercise book, but I can just open it. It seems like whatever page you open these books to, it's the right page for the day. You know, I don't have a lot of time to read a book start to finish, but I tend to gravitate toward ones that I can just quickly open and receive. Well, hey, everybody, um, we're taking time away from Vale's talk here, but this has been great. Everybody throw some ones if you like <laughs> what we learned about Vale or if you feel like you know her a little bit better now. But I'm going to turn it over to you now, Vale. Um, it's go with it. Um, so um, you're getting a bunch of ones, Vale. People love it. That's their way of clapping here on the internet. Uh -huh. um, yeah. So when they give you ones, that means that they liked it. And you've gotten a whole bunch of those from Nick and Robert and Daniel and Jess and Kim and Diane and a whole bunch of them. Alyssa did something pretty neat. I'm just going to read this real quick. She's one of our regulars. Um, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do it all to the glory of God. That's 1 Corinthians 10:31. Um, she just said that she wanted to share just the way the relationship to always doing your best on whatever you eat, drink, and whatever you do, do it to the glory. So I think it's somewhat similar to what you were saying on your spirituality. But anyway, thank you, Alyssa. All yours, Vale. You've got a wonderful presentation for us, and I'm going to uh, turn my webcam off in a second here. Take it away. Let's see. You guys can see my screen, I think. Still sharing. Is that right, Lynn? Yeah. Yep. You're, we're seeing right. it. You, if you want, you just go to kind of view, then we'd see only. We see the slides on the side. We can still see it fine, though. There you go. That'd okay. Did I turn my webcam off? No, I think you. I, you know what? You guys tell us. Give us ones if you think she should leave her webcam on. Give us nines if you think she should turn it off. You're getting a bunch of ones. I think I told you they they they, right. they want to they want to see they want to see okay. their speaker. <laughs> so uh, I also wanted to say about these spiritual principles we're talking about. Whatever religion or non-religion you have, it's, I think science is is coming closer to religion. And Masur Emoto's work has really inspired me to to show what water inside our bodies and in the soil and everywhere does. Uh, in reaction to our thoughts and our patterns, so it's changed the way I really think and act, you know, seeing that is really believing. So um, I wanted to share with you guys something really exciting for me that I never imagined four years ago, even learning about soil biology, that I would be seeing what I'm seeing in our fields now. Um, but basically, I always learned about grazing. This topic is going to be about grazing and about winter stockpiling and how to help your soil over winter, Think just three powerful strategies you can employ, probably even now still, um, to really make this next year better and um, help lower your cost and increase the health of your animals and land. And uh, I can just say that I live in wonder. The more I practice and let the plants and animals teach me, the more I see things that when I learned about them in science or agronomy, I mean, I didn't, I didn't have an agronomy degree actually, but they weren't explained to me as being possible or probable. And I think that the most fun thing for me about this work is seeing things that our minds might not have conceived as possible happen before our very eyes. And um, one of those things is that we have orchard grass here in Virginia in our pastures, and orchard grass is a cool season grass. It's only supposed to grow in the spring and the fall. Once it reaches 80 degrees Fahrenheit, it's supposed to shut down. And in the winter, it's supposed to go dormant. And this past year is the third, will be the second and a half growing year of this orchard grass we planted into bare crop fields that were chemically damaged. And with our regenerative strategies, this summer it was over 90 degrees for weeks at a time with a hot wind blowing. 
and our orchard grass was still growing and I was so confused because I'm like all the times before all the summers before in my life I've never seen that happen really especially in that kind of heat and um, I could I've seen it happen in a cooler summer where it stays around 80 and it's really humid and you know not too blazing hot um, and then the other week like at the end of January it had been 14 degrees and wind was blowing and snow and I'm out there with Keith filming in the field and this orchard grass is growing and there's germination and worm castings all over the soil and I'm like what is going on because basically we've moderated the soil environment so that the air temperature is not as really relevant to the productivity of our plant and so it encourages me that if, you, if we can start building our soil now whatever climate change is bringing us we can better weather it um, and we can really push the limits of what we thought was possible in our agronomic systems of which crops produce when and what yields we could imagine out of them you know I don't think we even scratched the surface and when I look back to old books from the 30s and you know farming it's like we knew a lot more than we know now and we forgot some things so I think we can not only remember what we learned but also actually do greater things so um, I just want to challenge you to open your mind to what's possible in your system and what your field look like now in a few years they could be very different so if you need any help with that um, I didn't actually put my email into the uh, PowerPoint, but I'm Vail, V-A-I-L, at simplesoilsolutions.com, and you can reach out. So um, basically this presentation... I'll put, I'll put that in the chat, Vail. Yeah, so okay, that. great. Uh, if you wish you didn't have to feed so much hay, um, you want to improve more quality and quantity of forage and diversity of plants in your field, um, and you're ready to work with nature and let your animals do most of the work for you and I will put in there plants and microbes doing a lot of the work um, so one of the questions that a lot of people have is how do you create pastures that will feed your herd year-round with minimal inputs and my answer to that is you know learn how to manage your soil so that you can basically germinate and grow more volume of plants um, so not only more volume, wider plants, wider blades, longer leaves, more plants per square foot, but it increased species diversity so you get more nutrition, different types of minerals, different types of fatty acids, different types of proteins and amino acids and um, at different times of year and then you can have a better quality of feed. So uh, a lot of people don't know and I actually didn't know this until a few years ago uh, it was a mentor of mine, Greg Judy, and a friend of his South from South Africa named Ian Mitchell Ines, I-N-N-E-S, that taught me this, but, and I'd seen grass my whole life. I had grazed horses my whole life and never understood what I was actually seeing, but when someone explained it to me, I looked back in all my memories and was like, I have seen that for years and never, it never even registered in my conscious awareness that it was important. And um, a stressed plant, whether it's a legume or a grass plant, will have a shorter and spikier leaf. Um, it will have smaller roots. And it will dry out and lack fertility, and it will go to seed very quickly. So um, that will decrease your yield of your pastures and your animal performance and cost you money. Oh, somehow, I, there we go. So today, we just want to cover three practices, like I said. Um, one is not to overgraze your winter stockpile and I have even had experienced grazers join our team and they're like well we can't overgraze a winter stockpile those plants are dormant it's one of the things that I kind of picked up on this year is like I need to explain this more you know the more I'm seeing about it the more I'm realizing all these layers of reasons and all these negative feedback loops that happens if you overgraze your winter stockpile so I want to explain that a little more and encourage you even if you've already overgraze it. I've got a strategy at the end to help you, but um, what to do next year so that you end up in a better place. Um, the second practice is really knowing when to begin regrazing in the spring. So it's very encouraging when we see that green up. We, our animals have been on hay for so long to put the animals out just a hair too early um, or to come back too quickly. So this concept of recovery period and regrazing is really important to achieve results. 
um, because you could have a good stockpile, but if you don't give it enough recovery between grazings, you're going to be stressing those plants, and they're going to be sacrificing their root growth, which will end up a destruction cycle on your soil, and the microbes won't be fed as much, and you'll have less grass each year and, and more weeds and things. Not that weeds are bad. I actually have a whole course on weeds, but um, ideally we want a variety of plants. So practice number three is if you have no more grass to go through without overgrazing, or you maybe overgraze a little or a lot, um, and you can't regraze yet because your plants aren't ready, what do you do? Well, right now, if you're feeding hay, which most of us are, there are very few people I know that feed no hay, um, I started employing what I thought was a sacrifice area strategy, and over many years have played with this strategy and patterning and the way I lay out the hay and the timing and the movement patterns of the animals. And I really developed it into something I want to call a build your soil strategy because those areas become the best areas on my farm. So what started out is I need an area to hold my animals back and feed hay on so that I don't destroy my fields. Now becomes where do I need to put my animals this year? Where do, my, where do I need to improve the most? And sometimes, you know, you can't put them on certain areas during certain times of the years because of topography or water or moisture or whatnot. But generally, there's areas of your farm that you can graze in the winter or feed hay on and really improve that. And I see a lot of people feeding hay on their land and even unrolling bales on their land and not getting these results. And I, I've really gone deeply into why, and there are a few key things um, that I don't know if I'll get into all the way today, but I do have courses on it to really teach the details of how to do this hay feeding strategy so that it's a really a build your soil strategy. So basically today I just want to give you the idea that maybe by using this hay feeding program the last few weeks or months that you have of winter, you could really, and holding your animals off a little more from regrazing, give your plants a couple extra weeks, two, three extra weeks, or a few extra days, or whatever it is, um, until you reach certain markers, you really could end up next winter with a very different um, field, a bit different stockpile, more stockpile, and a better field. And definitely by the second year, be well on your way to, to a really great um, pasture diversity and, and nutrition, nutrient cycling and energy cycling. So um, this is just a picture of one of our fields last fall. I think it was last fall. And um, this is what we were going into winter with, and I think this was at a farm, we only had three horses, so I did mob grazing with three horses before I could afford my cattle. It may have been two falls ago when this picture was taken, but it's, it basically shows, um, let's see if I can get fancy here, I'm just learning go to webinar, but um, if you see my pointer circling this grass here, you can kind of see that the blades, uh oh, go back, let me try a different tool. Uh, let me see a pen. So if you look around this grass that I'm holding, not only can you see that it's almost to my waist if I were going to unfurl the blades, and it's not rushing to seed, and we haven't bush hogged this field, so it's not like I've been clipping the pasture to keep it from seeding. The grass is not seeding out because it's not stressed. It's in a much more relaxed state. So it's growing this nice wide leaf, and I probably should have zoomed in on this, but, um, and the blades are kind of shiny you want to look out and see your plants kind of shiny because that tells you that they have the fatty acid and lipid layers. They have enough minerals cycling that they can actually make not only proteins and amino acids, but they can actually make fatty acids and secondary metabolites that will keep the insects off and help your animals have the right protein energy balance to balance their microflora and their guts and have their performance and pH and immune systems balanced. And then you can see how many blades there are per plant. Like the plants when they're healthy will tiller out which means from the base of the plant, they'll grow more and more leaves. And um, so you have more leaves per plant, more plants per square foot, more width on the blade, more length on the blade, and a better quality nutrition in that blade. Now in the background, you can see some areas around in here that are spiky and they're, they're not as wide. So this was a line right about here where our hay feeding had stopped. So you can see where the, the, the feed your soil strategy or sacrifice area strategy, the result of that, and you can see what the pasture would have normally produced in that same rest period recovery period. And you can see how the plants are kind of spiky and they're not really shiny and they're definitely not as green or as wide of blades. 
And so it just showed me very over and over again on different farms, I have seen that um, when you can focus on your soil, uh, you can really start to build enough stockpile that it might not get you through all of the winter. And depending on where you are, what species of grass, some of them stockpile better than others. But you know, every field is going to look different and have a different value. Um, and this is a fescue grass, and some people hate it in Virginia, and they try to eradicate it. We try to use the diversity of plants and use them at the right timing. So in the spring in Virginia, this plant produces an endophyte, and it poisons the cattle, sometimes causes them to abort fetuses, and they overheat, and their tails fall off, and all sorts of things. We've never had those extreme problems because we have a diversity. Um, but we graze it in the winter, and the endophyte is way lower. It's actually the alkaloids produced by the endophyte, the ergot, that um, poison the plant, the animals. And those poisons are lower in the winter. So after frost, it can actually maintain its nutritional value through February, as almost as if it was the day in November when it was still sunny and actively growing. So, um, and with a sward like this, with enough stockpile, like it can still grow during the winter. So your stockpile, even though you're grazing through it, can actually be regrowing. So there's a lot happening in this one picture, and I probably need to move faster. Wayne, will you give me a 20-minute heads up, um, if you can? And, yeah, uh, I would say, Bale, probably another seven or eight minutes. Oh, boy. All right. Well, I made way too many slides, so but, I'm going to go at rapid. You know what? You know what? Bale, 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 actually, I'm wrong. Sorry. I thought you wanted to know when it was 20 minutes to the top of the hour. Oh. You've got another 15, 15 minutes. You're in good shape. Okay, now if I can figure out how to get the thing to advance forward, um, maybe like that. But well, you handled that. You handled that cursor on those lines really well. So that that was. Very that good. was my first time. All right, I'm becoming a te technology, and I don't get along too well. But I'm trying to make peace with it. All right, somehow it's stuck on this slide, and I can't get it to go forward. I may have to escape out of this and go back into it. Sorry about that. Um, so even if your plants go dormant, your soil should not. So this was January 29th or somewhere in there on our farm this year. These were bare crop fields, and this is some orchard grass. Uh, I don't know if you can see my pointer, actually. But here's some orchard grass that, um, crap, now I'm really messing up. But can you guys see my pointer in here? I'm circling. Because I'd rather not draw on it. Maybe I can do a spotlight. Um, That's okay. Yeah, I don't see it. Uh, oh, you see it. They see it. Yeah, they see Basically, it, yeah. in the center of the picture, you see all these balls of things that look like soil? Those are actually nightcrawler poop. So those are worm castings. And all I did was go out in the field. It was actually snowing. It was about 14 degrees and really windy, and we were freezing our buns off. We had the cameras covered with plastic trying to keep the moisture off them, but it was starting to really snow, just beginning, and we're out there trying to catch this film, and I didn't know what to expect, because I'd been gone to winter conferences, and I just, I'm talking about what is the importance of all this stuff I left? Why not eat it with my animals, right? That's a waste. Oops, I'm not sure what's going on here. Um, yeah. Maybe I'll figure this out. Uh, okay, so... People would say all these brown leaves of orchard grass are a waste, but they're actually not because they're feeding the soil microbes. Because if the plant is a little bit dormant, it's not feeding as much sugars as when it's photosynthesizing and really pumping out carbon into the soil and building soil microbes. So all these dead leaves and brown leaves that my animals stomped down or they didn't eat, they have a couple of functions. One is they feed the soil microbes. Two is in the spring when it's really lush and growing, my animals get a little brown stuff with each bite of green, which means they have less diarrhea and a less protein excess in the spring. That's really important because your animals cannot perform well in the spring and get very sick because they're in a protein excess. If you've grazed all your grass off to one or two inches or three or four inches, everything that grows is basically lush, high protein, overly lush stuff. You can cause a lot of gut imbalances on your animals. So in the winter, those plants may be somewhat dormant, and the soil should still be building. Winter is the time when your soil builds the most under this stockpile, under this carbon blanket. So it doesn't happen if you overgraze that field and that cold air is hitting the soil. It only happens if you've left. I mean, this is like six to, this is, some of this is like 12 to 15 inches of stockpile. We didn't have to leave quite that much, but 
um, we didn't need it because we had enough grass. So we stomped it down, and when I pulled that soil back, all I saw was just covered in earthworm castings. And that gets even more interesting. I'll show you the next slide. So I pick up some of that newly formed soil. I don't know why it's going backwards. But um, basically, the microbes, that's really weird. It must be something on my mouse that I'm touching. Um, basically, those microbes are aggregating the soil. I've actually picked up one of the clumps. You can't see my other hand. But the whole soil just stayed together. Now, that is because the bacteria have glued the microaggregates together, the sand, silt, and clay particles, into little balls. And the fungi have glued those, mac those microaggregates into macroaggregates. So all those balls that you see, let's see if I can, um, I don't want to use the pen again because it, it froze up my mouse. But um, basically, you can see in the top clump that there's all these clumps of clumps. And that's what the bacteria in soil food web will do for you if you're feeding them. If you starve them all winter, they're not going to be doing this over the winter, and they're not going to wake up in the spring. So your soil microbes need to eat every day, they need air every day, they need water every day, and they need warmth. If you were naked, and you were starving, and you were left out on the cold all winter, and then come spring you were expected to go to work, what kind of shape would you be in in the spring? You don't want your microbes going to sleep all winter. You want to give them food through living roots as much as possible. So in your gardens you want to have a cover crop, and in your fields you want to have you notice these orchard grass and, and, and fescue plants are green in January. They're not all dormant. And that's what I was saying in the beginning, that I saw things happen this year that don't normally happen. Normally, they're almost all brown. And those plants did not go completely dormant. Now, we didn't have a completely extreme winter, but we've had very cold snaps where it didn't get over 30 for a week or so. And they should be dormant. So that's showing me that I'm going in the right direction with my soil. So there's a little close-up of some of these aggregates starting to happen. Now, our clay is very red, and I had another picture I didn't get in here. Right next to this, um, there was red clay, and the soil is very red. So the fact that it's turning nice and dark is a good sign. The fact that it's not just stuck together red clay, this is sticky red clay. The calcium-magnesium ratios are way off. But what happens is these fungi are calcium carbonate. All their bodies are built of calcium and carbon. And when they start um, activating in the soil, they change the whole, um, all of your base saturations and your minerals start to come into balance. And um, there's different ways to support that. But basically, by feeding them with the basics, this is free. This is not something we hauled into the field. This is just using the animals, their feet, their saliva, their dung, their urine, their hooves. You know, the, the kinetic energy of them tugging on the grass is stimulating the microbes differently than a mower. And the grasses themselves and the plants and their sugars, we're just using what nature gave us. We're not importing things into the farm. So um, we didn't put down any compost. We didn't, you know, we haven't done a lot of the things that a lot of people do to improve their soil. And there are times when you need to do that. But we're just trying to show you, use what's free first, what's cheap second, and what's expensive third, or not at all. So um, there's another close-up of it, just pulling it apart there. Oops. Somehow this formatting got really messed up. Um, this was a whole list of things that happens. <laughs> this is probably the universe going, don't make a slide that's just 16 things in a list. So I had a list. Um, the slide background was black, and the, the text was white. Uh, let's see. What, let me see if I can... But basically, it's what happens when you start to overgraze your soil. Um, let's see if I can fix this here so you can see it. It's not really working right now. So I'm going to go back to the presenter view and just talk through it. But basically, you can see the word detriment. It says when you overgraze your soil, you take too much off the top, you end up with more bare soil which decreases the winter temp of your soil. So I've gone to places where I've overgrazed, right next to a place that the animals avoided. I've poked my finger in the soil, and that's really good for you to do. And feel that. You don't need a thermometer. You just need your finger. You can feel if the animals took the, you know, if it's just a patch of grass they liked better, and they took it down to a couple inches instead of leaving a nice, you know, residual. Go ahead on a winter morning and go and feel that soil, and you'll feel an exponential difference between where there was a carbon blanket and not. Once you start that freezing process, the microbes have to go to sleep. They have to protect their bodies, and so they encapsulate, and they form these, you know, they wall off, and they stop 
cycling minerals, they stop cycling nutrients, they stop doing all the wonderful things of building soul structure, and they just go to sleep and they kind of hunker down. And so not only does it, it starts to increase wind erosion, water erosion, um, freezing, and in the, as soon as it starts getting hot, you get more crusting and, and a hotter soil temp. So you basically lose plants, you get more moisture loss, you, um, because you lose the microbes, you lose nutrient potential, and you decrease food for those microbes and you decrease soil carbon. So there's a whole cascade of um, negative feedback loops that happen with this one mistake that so many people make. They're try you're trying to feed the animal, and I understand that, but if you, if you short, short circuit the soil, and you just feed your animal, and you're not thinking about your underground herd, you basically end up with less food year after year, and more costs, and more unhealthy animals. So that's about the first practice. That's kind of wrapping that up. Like, please don't overgraze your pastures. And, and I used to think four inches was enough, and now I'm saying six to eight minimum. Eight to 12 is even better. Um, you leave as much as you can. Um, the second practice I want to talk about that you can do this spring, because we haven't gotten the full green up yet for most of you, is don't regraze too soon. Don't put your animals out too soon, and don't come back around your farm, even if you're rotational grazing, don't come back too soon. So one of the things is to count the leaves on your plants. So pick a plant from the base, just rip it off, and then count the leaves that are emerging. We have a video of this on our website, simplesoilsolutions.com. It's on the bottom of this slide. And it shows you actually counting the leaves. So you want to wait till the plant has four leaves. Now, sometimes the plant can fool you because they can be 12 inches tall. They can look really green, but they're only at the beginning of their third leaf stage. And if you graze the plant too early, what happens is you take away the solar panel, and it hasn't had a chance to recharge the root. So the plant has gone through winter, and it's basically been living off of its savings account. It's been living off of the root reserves of carbon. It's been photosynthesizing when it can, but it, it grows this solar panel in the spring, the leaves. And when you take those off too soon, the plant hasn't had enough time to send carbon down to the roots and regrow roots deeper. And so you basically short circuit the plant and you take away, it's like taking all the savings away. And then the plant has to use even more savings to regrow the re leaf the second time. And if you come back too soon, then you've really almost killed that plant. Or if you leave the animals in too long, you kill that plant because um, overgrazing is not a function of the number of animals on the paddock or on the farm. It's a function of the amount of time those animals are exposed to those plants. And I didn't know this. You can overgraze, you cannot overgraze a field, but you can overgraze a plant. So I talk a lot about that in other talks. I don't have a lot of time to go into that, but um, basically when the animal takes a second bite off that plant, if you've left it in there too long, even if it's only one animal on a 10-acre field, if you watch, the animal will graze, and then about the second or third day, come back and regraze where it grazed the first day. It's because those plants are getting really tender and juicy because and they're getting a lot of energy because they're regrowing new leaf. And so instead of going and grazing the other five acres that it could, or the taller, older plants, the animal goes back to the same plant it grazed before and takes another bite. And that's how overgrazing happens. And then you get more spacing between your plants and the desirable species are being killed off in your field. So you want to count those leaves. You want to wait until the plants are to regraze at least one to two inches taller than the previous time you grazed. It's not always easy to do. And the third strategy will teach you what to do while you're waiting for that to happen. And you want to give your perennial grasses at least a 35-day recovery period. But don't obsess about the number of days. We've gone as long as 80 or 90. You don't want to overrest the field, but um, you just don't want to come back sooner than that. Now, if you're on a winter annual or a summer annual that you've planted into your pastures or you're grazing a cover crop, you can come through sooner than that because those annuals have a different life cycle. But on your perennial grasses, you want to give at least a 35-day recovery period. And if you want to increase diversity in your fields, this is something I go into a lot, and this is one of the most profound realizations I had by just being a doer and observing is instead of going around the same rotation around your farm in the same order or instead of grazing your same fields at the same time of year like I always graze this field in the winter and then I go to this one in the spring vary the time of year you rest the field if you think about it when you're resting the field if you have a nice carbon blanket and you've stomped down more than you've taken 
you basically are setting seed germination to happen because you've covered the soil, you've got this nice, moist, warm, or cool in the summer, even moisture germination mat, and you've got all these seeds in the seed bank that are waiting to come out. And if you rest it at a different time of year, you're going to get different species coming in your field. And um, if you vary the number of days. So we've done experiments where we've rested a field for 35 days and we've gotten certain plants germinating. And then we've been able to rest it for 80 days and we see that some of the more productive native species of grasses take longer to germinate. So they're not going to germinate in your 35 day rest period. So sometimes you have to vary the patterning. It's that variance of patterning. It's that adaptive management. Um, you don't have to stomp every field flat every time you graze it. You can basically, um, if you get that field stomped really well once a year, get a lot of stuff put back down, depending on your microbial activity, you might see that last for a little while. When you start seeing all that you stomp being digested and that residue disappearing, you need to stomp it again or feed hay on it or somehow get that soil covered again. But basically, don't go off a calendar date for your rotations. Like I always start grazing on the 15th of March. That's a mistake a lot of people make. But go off of biological signs. Um, when do the dogwoods bloom? Or when does a certain tree species come to bloom? Or, like I said, go off the leaves of your plant. Go off the biological signs because every year is different. Your farm is very different every year, even if it's the same time of year. So you have to be adaptive. You have to pay attention. So we have a lot of videos on simplesoilsolutions.com. We're going to be putting more up. You can watch this stuff. We're trying to bring it to you as if you're with me in the field to know how to read the signs. But your plants and animals are your best teachers. They're your living laboratory. They know more than any laboratory. They're measuring more than any laboratory. The plants are measuring the soil. The animals are measuring the soil and the plants. So pay attention to them. They're very wise. So um, this is a little case study where we left more residual on the ground. And this is come spring. We looked at it compared to a neighbor's farm where she had, she had a farmer that was still rotating his animals, but he had overgrazed the field in the winter. And over a 12-day period, we got at least 16 to 20 inches more growth than she did. So this is March 18th. Pay attention here because this field's going to look very different come March 30th. So there's March 30th, same field. You can see all those brown leaves. Well, look at all that leaf that I wasted. Why didn't I graze that? Well, my animals are going to be eating that with every green bite, so they're going to be getting less of a protein excess. Um, and there I am kneeling in the field. Um, that's what it looked like across our field come March 30th of last year when, you know, 12 days before, I looked at it was barely covering my knee. You know, it still was, if you pick up, up some of those plants, there were still six or eight inches, but the soil was covered, but it didn't look like much activity was going to happen. You know, there's a lot of brown, not all, you know, there's some green, but it didn't look very thick. And then all of a sudden, those plants start tillering out. Now, they're not waxy and they're not shiny and they're not as dark green yet. And that's because this field is coming from bare soil. <clears throat> the field in the first picture had been in perennial grasses for a lot longer. So we aren't getting the plant. They're still healing from the mineral cycling. The microbial communities are still healing. So it's also a different species grass that isn't naturally shiny. But look at the, um, the grazing stick there. We've got you know at least 16. Some of those plants were definitely 20, 22 inches. <coughs> and then our neighbor's farm. In the same period, that's what her plant, her field looked like on the same day as this. So you can see that I have pictures from March 18th, but it really didn't look much different. So in, in the same time period, even without animals on it, she didn't get a lot of regrowth because she had these short, tiny roots. Now, this is an extreme example. This is very overgrazed, and your field might, might not be that overgrazed. Now, notice she doesn't have bare soil, which is good but she's still not getting the nutrient cycling and the root depth. So what happens is in the summer, her fields just dry up and all the weeds grow. So there's a picture of diversity that was happening. We were talking about diversity. Um, there's chicory, which is a beneficial form behind this clover. There's different species of clovers. There's henbit. There's grasses. So if you start leaving more residual, um, you're going to start seeing more diversity. How are we doing on time, Wayne? I'm over time. <laughs> yeah, we're we're getting close. We the only okay. challenge we have is we have we have another webinar that we probably need to start getting ready for in about 12, 15 minutes. So let's take questions. Um, I'll just flip through these slides really fast like a slideshow. But this was a hay feeding program that we did, and we teach more about this in our course. 
If you want to learn about it, you can go to grazingpower.com. It's on our website. But basically, here is from December 30th, and all we did was feed the hay in a certain pattern, and then we rested the field. We made sure the soil was not left bare, and we had no fertilizers, no seeds, no lime, and the field came back with a lot of diversity. So you can basically use these... Um, we just did what we had to do, which was feed the animals hay differently, and we did it in a different pattern. We didn't add any more money, and then we just let the field rest. And so you can see it really from April 9th, filling in April 23rd. We actually let this field go to seed, so we were actually, when we came back and threw and grazed, the seeds were viable, we stomped those in, so we basically used the animals. So I just want to ask what is possible for you. Think about it. Um, I go through a lot, and that health is not a static destination. It's not like you get your fields healthy and the work stops. It's really a dynamic range, and if you can learn to read these little signs that you're going off the highway before you crash into the ditch and you're bumping into trees and rocks, you can steer your system and, and let it guide you, and you can stay within this range of health. So that's pretty much the point. Um, I'd love to take some questions from you guys. I'm sorry I... Feel like I just had a huge model. Oh, no, you're great. Yeah. <laughs> um, you guys throw some questions in. While she's doing that, though, I'm going to put something up. I'm going to grab the screen for a second. So you guys keep your typing. Give her some ones, by the way, if you like this. Um, and I'm going to take the screen just a second here for just a little bit. And um, i got to put it on the right screen here. There we go. Um, so you guys should be seeing something that says Grazing Power Training Program. And I just want to put this up here. So this is on Bale's website. At, I'm putting it in the chat. It's actually, I'll put it over in the questions in just a second while you guys are getting your fingers moving to ask questions. Um, but this is the course that Bale's been talking about. She's starting it next week, a week from today. And it's actually live for four months. And, and then she'll also be having replays, so that means you can be with Vail and get her answering questions. There is nobody that I know, and Mark Shepard's the best one to say this. Mark Shepard quoted to me, I've never seen anybody turn a pasture around in the kind of time frame that Vail did with what she's got. This is somebody who knows what she's doing. So here you can see, I'm just scrolling down. The, the course a little bit, and, and you can see there's online, and, and go and find this, um, and uh, this is going to be a great course. Vale is going to, like I said, going to start doing a series with us later. Um, you you should sign up. You want to learn something about grazing, and you should do this course. So anyway, here are some uh, here are some questions, Vale. We had one way back from Alyssa, which was great. What's your annual average annual rainfall? We are at about where we're all where we're seeing all. The... We have about 40 inches. We're very 40. blessed, but 40. more and more like this summer, we had nine weeks with no rain. Um, I think we had less than four inches between July and the end of September. So um, we had a very hot, dry summer. So it it tends tending to come in more spurts and more periods without rain. So. There's different strategies if you're in awesome. a dry and range system, yeah. Um, Val, you have a request, and I'll ask you this. Since they said, since you went through the last slide so quickly, could I, could we give them a little bonus, and could you get me, just send me the send me your slides, and I already have the list of everybody that attended, and I'll send it out to them, and it's also a way I can. I'll get in their ear about the course again on an email. So if you'll send those to me, we'll send those slides out to all of you, and I'm I'm hoping that Vail says yes. Oh yes, definitely. And there's some videos on the website that show the more the patterning of the hay feeding. The last point was really what to do now, and it's important. Um, but it basically was spreading out the hay in different ways, and and a lot of people do it, but they don't get the same results. So I've tried to narrow down to what are the key things you have to do to get good results with your hay feeding program. Um, so yes, I would definitely send those slides. It's much needed information, and we want to get this information out there. We want to rebuild soil everywhere. So, <laughs> by the way, I, I, the the last question was from, uh, or the comment about the 
slides was from Gigi. I love her name, by the way, Gigi Goen. That's a great name. Um, so Robert has a question here. Um, you have some interesting videos on your Simple Solutions website. I wonder if you'll be putting up any microscope images of our various soil friends and critters. Ah, oh, that's a great idea. I do have some microscope images that I could put up. Some of them were taken way back in the day when I had to hold the digital camera over my scope. <laughs> but they're awesome. Yeah, I can do that. Um, can you, let's see. I was trying to think if you could send me an email with that request and I can try to get that. We really try to improve the website. It's, it's a 2012 site and it's been on our list. We want to revamp it. Vale, you're going to get a copy of all these questions and all the people's okay. names and everything, so right. you'll have them to be able to get back to. So um, come on, guys. Get your fingers moving. Ask some more questions. By the way, you got lots of ones earlier, people saying they loved it. Matter of fact, you had one person that said, you know what? I'm not worried about the time. There's, there's not anything else I could be doing that's more important than this right now, so you just go as long as you want. Um, so Diane says, this was terrific. She's obviously done the hard work, and, and I'll be about to translate this to my acreage. That's only sad-looking grassland. Don't complain. You're, gra you're probably looking fine, and you can do a great job with it, Diane. It can um, bounce back so yeah. fast. Yeah, I mean. Yeah. Two, three years goes by in the um, of an eye, so. So, Gigi, you're saying, I met you at Future Harbor Harvest Casa in January. Do you mean you met Vale? I think you probably yeah. met Vale. She did. Uh, okay. All right, cool. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Here's one. Here's one from Catherine. Could you add older but not composted horse manure to bear patches and then put a layer of hay on it yeah. and be helpful to microbes? That, that was your question. You can do that. Yeah. We try to use strategies that make the animals put the manure in there for us, but if you're dealing with a small area and you have the ability to do that, that's definitely better. Any kind of bare area or even just only has an inch or so of grass, just go ahead and cover it. Don't cover it too thick. You, do, you want it to be less than you know, an inch or so. Um, you just want to get it covered and you want it, the grasses to be able to come through it. So a seed that's in your seed bank only has a certain amount of stored energy. And it's got to reach light before it can start to photosynthesize, to grow roots, to actually survive. So if you make the layer too thick, there may be seeds germinating and that are not reaching light. And you'll know that by digging through the residue. And if you see these white things that look like germinating seeds that haven't reached light, you've got the layer too thick. Super. Um, they, I'll, I'll ask you this another time, but I, I have, a, you know, we get about... 13 inches of rainfall, and I have a brand new pasture that I'm rehabbing, and I have mil megatons of composted alpaca manure. At some point, I'm going to ask you how thick I should put. I'll show you some. I'll send you some yeah. pictures, and you can see what it looks like, and then how much, and then what I should do on top of it after I put it on. Send me um, uh, how much if it's just manure, or if it had any carbon in the compost, or what you put in that compost. Yeah, it's, it is a combination. It's a pretty good brown, so it's got about the right ratios of both both green and, uh, and the manure. So um, let's see. We've got several other really great questions. And, guys, we'll go for about another five minutes here, and then we've got to get ready for our next one, which, by the way, you guys should come and see. One guy who's almost a neighbor a little way up the road in Washington, D.C. area. Um, and Jerry Peliquin, by the way, who we got so many neat personalities. Jerry was the drummer for Jefferson Airplane, by the way, a long time ago. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, so here's one great question from Kim. Is your weed strategy basically to crowd out weeds? And then she's talking about a big problem in our area is a big problem in our area is perilla. No animals we have eat it. So um, our weed strategy involves changing the habitat so that the weeds don't thrive. So we actually, by changing what we feed the soil from the top, we change the microbiology and we change the chemistry and physics of the soil, the forms of nitrogen in the soil, and we basically, that starts to favor grass and legume growth and, you know, when you get a dominance of one weed in an area, it's just trying to heal the soil. So we just help the weed heal the soil faster 
and then it doesn't thrive. So uh, we've done this on a lot of different properties, crop farms, pastures. You know, I'm someone that if someone tells me something, I have to do it and prove it to myself. <laughs> and uh, Elaine Bingham said, you know, to me a long time ago, if you change the soil biology, the weeds won't grow. But once I started learning it, changing the soil biology, we've found ways to do it that don't involve, you know, necessarily spraying composting and microbes out there, but by how we treat the soil, by the patterns of animals and movement on our land, by what are we stomping down, and is it green or is it brown when we stomp it down, you know, what are we feeding that soil, and we can change the microbiology by who we feed. There's a Native American um, legend about the black wolf and the white wolf, and you know, which one survives, the black wolf symbolizing evil and the white wolf symbolizing good, and you know, it's like, well, the one that you feed survives, and so the weeds are just reflection of the underlying soil, what they call biogeochemistry. So that's the biology, the chemistry, and the physics that are happening, and I want to add the spirituality too, but um, basically, you know, if you change the habitat, you change the foods, there will be diversity coming in that area. Super. Two more questions, everybody. These are great ones, by the way. Marvin Weber has a good one. In our climate, it's often wet in some of the winter months. Would it not be advisable to feed outside here? I think he means outside of the wet areas. Um, so that's I think it might be, do you mean that you feed in a barn? Because a lot of people don't put their animals on the soil. Oh, and no, I, the you know what? I, I think you're, you're, you're probably right, Vale. That's probably the better <laughs> interpretation. Not be advisable to feed outside, right? There we go. And this is where I integrate the permaculture design a lot because you have to look at your site and see are there any well drained areas that you can access? Do you have water? You know, you may not have those areas to start um, where you may need to use your barn in a different way, kind of similar to the way Joel Salatin does, where he makes a bed and pack and then uses the pigs to turn it, you know, using that compost back on the fields. but eventually you should be able to either scape your farm using permaculture and build your soil using the microbiology and the plant roots to restructure your soil so that it drains better. Um, you should be able to break any hard pans underneath there without machines um, and you know it can take time so I really don't want to say yeah feed your animals outside not looking at the conditions um, but certainly maybe you could when you can get your animals outside, maybe you have a dry, hot period where you can use your hay feeding strategy then and let that during the wet period digest and let the soil structure build and keep the animals off. And you know, sometimes you come at it the reverse way instead of trying to come at the problem head on. We try to figure out where are the timings and patternings we can inject ourselves into the system in positive ways. Awesome. Last question and then we're going to run everybody. I'm going to thank um, veil in advance. Veil, this has been awesome. Everybody obviously loves it. I've got up here on the screen still, everybody, about the course. You can just go to the website and look at that. You've got the links. Um, and then last question. And thank you guys. Thank to all of you. By the way, Vale, almost everybody that started is still here now. So Aww. that doesn't happen all the time. Um, when you first started working your farm, did you reseed your pasture fields or have you just let them renew themselves through use? So I've worked on a lot of different farms in a lot of different counties, and ones that had any grass at all, we did not reseed. Although I did that for years, I added seed, and I added fertilizer, and P and K to soil test, and lime, you know, for years unsuccessfully. But we've been more successful not having to add seed on perennial ground that has some type of plants growing on it, and we also use the hay. A lot of times we'll buy a first cutting hay or even the second cutting hay that doesn't have seed head, we've seen those plants. We fed second cutting hay with beautiful leaf, no seed in it. We feed it out, and yet we get those plants germinating. Now, there must have been some seed in there or in our seed bank. So it depends on the ground. If you're starting with anything that isn't just bare, crusted cropland, you know, you pretty much probably don't have to seed. It depends on your budget also and your goals and how quickly you want to get there and how much land you have. Um, we did add seed to our current farm because it was like 180 acres of open land that was it was cropped but not cover crop and it was crusting and we did a cover crop in the summer and we came in in the fall we killed the cover crop with just the animals with no herbicides and we 
no-till drilled a species mixture, like 11 species, into our um, into that stomp down cover crop. And we did that because I couldn't cover 180 acres of land with hay, and I didn't want to leave that soil eroding and, and all of that. So it, it was a lot more budget, though. So you have to look at your goals, your timing. What do you have? I try to look at what do I have that's cheap or free? You know, what's the quickest way I can do this um, without breaking the bank? Because if you go bankrupt, you can't stay in business. So sometimes, you know, you've got to do pieces of your farm at a time. And even if you had to lease out the other land to someone who was going to cover crop it and crop it for a few more years, it really, if, if money matters, sometimes you have to do things slower than you want. But um, there's always a way forward. And if you anchor yourself in the principles of nature, you'll go forward and you won't be pulling yourself left and right at the same time. You'll be pulling it in the direction you want to pull the system. We go into this thing. Awesome. This is really good. We're going to go step by step through it. So I'd love to see you guys more, and, and we'll be teaching more with Wayne. So um, we're not going to start next week just because the course starts next week. And I'm, But um, we will yeah. be starting soon. So Again, lots more ones. And thank yous to you, Vale. I thank all of you guys. I'm going to stop the recording here in a second and um, go ahead and go off. And it gets kind of abrupt at the end. But if you can, come to our next one with uh, yeah. Jerry Peliquin and Dave Rozier. And then and go to the site and look up at the course, see if it might be something for you, everybody. See everybody soon and have a wonderful rest of your day and evening, Vale. And we'll see everybody on the other side. All right. <laughs>